gradually we learned who all the players were. You know, mm-hmm. people we'd we'd meet somebody in Morris's office, and a week later we'd we'd see him on TV being hauled out of a warehouse in New Jersey or something, <laughs> handcuffs, you know, and uh, uh, arrested. And say, isn't that the guy we just met up in Morris's office? And it was. Mm-hmm. And all the people that we saw on TV, you know, the big mobsters, were all hanging out at roulette. And they used it for everything from a social club to laundering money and, uh, you know, God knows what was going on up there. So, I mean, it was, that was what we were trying to have a pop career around. Mm -hmm. And the music endured. I mean, you went from Hanky Panky to 23 gold singles, nine gold and platinum albums, over 100 million albums or million records sold worldwide. Yeah. One heck of a ride you were on. and. (laughs) And the and the way you, your music evolved too through the, the times and the changes of the '60s is something that should be commended too. I mean, well, thank you, you. You weren't just some one-hit wonder. It came and went. You, you you actually had the talent and the goods to keep delivering these these wonderful tracks that were for many the soundtrack of their their lives and their maturity. Well, you know what was so amazing is we were at roulette. Strangely enough, they really needed us because they hadn't had a hit really in almost three years, a big hit. And so they really gave us the keys to the candy store and left control of our career in our own hands, which was unheard of Mm -hmm. uh, back then, and allowed me and the group to make decisions about every aspect of of our career. And I I really credit them. That's why I have such mixed feelings about all this, because, uh, you know, it was so dark and sinister on one side, and yet, on the creative level, we probably couldn't have done any better. And so I was allowed to put a really great production team together. And uh, we and uh, actually, we had, we'd had three hits before I was really... Uh, we had Hanky Panky and Say I Am and It's Only Love before I Think We're Alone. And starting with I Think We're Alone now, we put our own production team together. Mm-hmm. And from there, things really evolved quickly. And... Uh, uh, Honestly, in the book, then, I, I, I tell the story of how, you know, creatively we evolved because it was really morphing into many different characters. And every so often we'd hit a record that really, like, I think We're Alone Now was a big breakthrough record for us, really changed our, mm-hmm. our whole mode of operation. And then a record like Crimson and Clover, and Crimson and Clover, for example, with, even with as many hits as we had, like Moni Moni, what, that was really a sort of a throwback to the early 60s. Crimson and Clover allowed us to make the move from AM Top 40 to FM Album Rock. Mm-hmm. Into the more progressive areas right. and the waters that what FM was going through. Correct, and because right at that moment was when everything was changing. And right at that moment that we had Crimson and Clover, um, uh, uh, there was this mass extinction of all the singles acts. Mm-hmm. You know, we went, and this is this actually is a true story. Um, we teamed up with Hubert Humphrey, who was running for president that year. He's the vice president. Mm-hmm. When we went out on the road with Hubert Humphrey, uh, that's a whole story on its own, but when we went on the road, road uh, this would have been in August of, of 68, uh, all the, the biggest acts on the radio were all singles acts. It was us and the Rascals and... Association and the Buckinghams and oh, Gary Puckett. Music. We get back 90 days later, and it's all album acts. It's Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Led Zeppelin, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Joe mm-hmm. Cocker, and, and the whole industry had turned upside down. And we knew that if we didn't make a move right then to sell albums, that we were going to be just like our, our, our friends who basically stopped having hits at that moment. Mm-hmm. There was a couple who went on like the Doors and Sly and the Family Stone. There was, there was, I'm, not everybody was affected like that, but most of them were. So, we were just so fortunate to have Crimson and Clover right at that moment, because no other single that we ever worked on would have allowed us in one single to make that move from AM to FM and to straddle that fence and uh, and sell albums because it was all about selling albums then at that point. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at a few facts here. Uh, you know, it says uh, that you guys were one of the you and the Shondells were one of the first groups to uh, produce music videos, right. and that started with Moni Moni. Right. I mean, you guys are uh, groundbreakers there. I mean, that's uh, you know, like well, you 10, know, what 13 years prior we, to be. we couldn't get them played anywhere, and there was this big, uh, uh, the big backlash to it from American television. They didn't want rock and roll people telling them what to do. To me, it made all the sense in the world to mm-hmm. make a film of your hit record. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you it just, know, it just you just go all over the world, sense. places you couldn't go, and you know, you could only appear one place at a time. So why wouldn't you do that? So uh, we started with Moni Moni, and uh, about the only place we could get the thing played was in European movie theaters. <laughs> <laughs> Between, between the double features, you know, so it was me and Daffy Duck for a long time. <laughs> yeah, but that, uh, you know, that's the power of uh, music and, and having a video like that. That just brings more people out and more well, people to buy enough. the records. That's true enough, but we couldn't get it played on American television. Mm-hmm. And I'm reading here, you know, 1969, though, there's got to be one of those moments uh, that you're saying, man, if we if we would have made this decision, it's uh, in regards to Woodstock. You, yeah. you guys were offered uh, a slot to Yep, we sure were. Uh, Artie Kornfeld, who was one of the promoters of the show, uh, contacted. He and I were friends, and we contact. He contacted my secretary at Roulette, and uh, we were in Hawaii at the time. And Crystal Blue was number one, and we were literally sitting at uh, the foot of Diamond Head in a Spanish villa, <laughs> right on the ocean. Beautiful. Stuff. And uh, in between two gigs out there, and uh, all of a sudden the phone rings and. Joanne says to me, listen, uh, Artie says, uh, I want to know if you come up to, uh, come back to New York and play a pig farm in upstate New York. <laughs> I said, what did you say? <laughs> she says, yeah. I said, did you say come and play a pig farm? And she said, well, yeah, she says it's supposed to be a big gig. There's going to be a lot of people. There. I said, you got to be kidding. I said, if, if I'm not there, start without us, okay? I said, you're asking me to leave paradise and fly 6,000 miles to play a pig farm, right? I said, so I hang up the phone, and I go, bang. And by Friday of that week, we knew we really screwed up really bad. And uh, it was called Woodstock, and they started without us. Well, you know, it doesn't seem that uh, tempting when somebody's calling you up to offer you a slot to play in a pig field. No, I mean, really, true. in your defense. I mean, Well, who knew? <laughs> You know, it, it, yeah, the whole cultural significance. Like, yeah, you, you you can't foretell something like that. Those we things just happen. We made the next one though. The next one was the Atlanta Pop Festival. Oh yes, and we yes. made that one. They actually had more people in Atlanta than they did in, at Woodstock. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, heavy hitters that uh, played that one as well. Yeah, it's basically the same people. Yeah, and uh, well. You know, we talk about uh, going into the '70s now. Uh, this is when you you started uh, get, you know going into uh, the more in, as a solo act too. I mean, yeah, yeah. And, well, in 1970, uh, we had been going for five years, and we were exhausted, and we took some time off. Uh, we took about six months off, and we had planned on getting back together, and we just didn't. Mike and and uh, Mike uh, uh, basically uh, started doing uh, uh, a group called the uh, called Hog Heaven. The group uh, Chandels became this group, Hog Heaven. Mm-hmm. Actually, recorded a couple albums with Roulette, and then uh, Eddie and Ronnie started a, a very successful recording studio in Pittsburgh. And uh, Mike got off into Christian music then, and and uh, uh, so we just kind of went our separate ways. I started producing at Columbia and I produced uh, Exile and Patty Austin and Mm -hmm. um, you know I was uh, producing other acts and then I went back in the studio myself then in in, uh, uh, 71 and started a solo career with Dragon Alliance and I'm Coming Home and we started had another 12 uh, uh, chart records with Roulette Mm-hmm. And they're listening to a, a great uh, double disc that came out a couple of years ago called 40 Years, the Complete Singles Collection. Right. On the second disc, yeah, it really gave me a good taste of what happened, you know, what went on with you in the 70s. And a lot of that stuff is, I, I got to give you, I got to tip the hat to you uh, yet again here. I, I wasn't too familiar with it, but I came out really enjoying what you were doing. Well, I'm uh, glad. You know, we had, we basically, the 40-year package, which is in the stores now, uh, is uh, all... 47 of our singles released back-to-back. In other mm-hmm. words, they're all sequential. So 
I left Roulette in 1974 and uh, uh, did a single with them.